Hello, hello? Yay! It works, okay. So, um, okay, perfect. So, first off, uh, I just would like to apologize. Um, this, like, 15 second thing, uh, I needed to uh, script myself to be able to fit it in, otherwise I would just die at the second slide. And um, so, yeah, and of course I didn't manage to memorize my script because I basically, of course, finished my slides like last night, late, or early this morning. Uh, okay, but uh, here goes. So how does time work? Remember uh, when we used to think that the Earth was flat and it turned out, in fact, that it was wrong, it's round? Well, our intuition about time is wrong in a very similar way. Galileo was when sitting in a church and he noticed this chandelier uh, swinging. Using his pulse to measure time, he noticed that one swing always took the same amount of time. The pendulum was born. This is how we measure time. Uh, we take something which is a repetitive process and just count the number of repetitions. For example, the number of times the sun rises for the days, the number of summers for the years, the number of full moons for the months, or uh, simply the number of swings of the pendulum. We imagine time as something universal, which applies to everyone in the same way. When an hour goes by on my watch, I assume that an hour also goes by on my friend's watch, no matter what he, where he is or what he's doing. Intuitively, we imagine time as some sort of straight line. Um, at any particular point on that line, we can put all the events of the world which happened at that time. A set of experiments in the 1880s uh, would show us that something is very, very, very wrong with this intuition. What the experiments were effectively equivalent to was having uh, two people measuring the speed of some beam of light. One person at a standstill, and another person going in the same direction as the beam of light at a speed v. Now, if a person walks at a speed of three kilometers per hour in a train, and that train goes at 60 kilometers per hour, then somebody outside the train will see the person inside the train going at 63 kilometers per hour, right? Thus, uh, it was expected that if light was going at a speed c, as seen from inside the train, and that train was going at a speed v, then the light should be seen to go at a speed c plus v by somebody outside the train. Well, this is not what happened. Both the person inside the train and the person outside the train measured the light as going away from them at the same speed. Now, let me repeat this. One person is moving really, really fast in one direction, and the other person is still. They measure the same beam of light, and they measure it to be moving at the same speed with respect to themselves. So what is the implication of this? To find out, we build a light clock. It's really simple, just two mirrors and a pulse of light bouncing in between them. Uh, to measure time, we count the number of bounces. Now, give each of the persons inside and outside the train one of those clocks, and send the train out at the speed of light. Now remember, from the previous experiment, no matter how fast you're going, you see the light moving away from you at the same speed. That means that when either of the two people are looking at their own clock, it seems to be perfectly normal and take at the right speed because they always see the pulse going at the speed of light respective to either of the two mirrors of their own clock. But now imagine you're the person outside looking at the clock of the person inside. The mirrors of the clock are going to the right that's right. They're going to the right at the speed of light, and so is the pulse. So the pulse can never catch up to the mirror. That means that the clock doesn't tick. You see the time has frozen inside the train. If the train went a bit slower than, this, than, uh, than the speed of light, the clock would tick, but slowly. If it went faster, the clock would tick, but backwards. So it isn't really that you can't really go faster than the speed of light, just that if you do, you stop going forward in time. Um, in fact, we find that if we draw a space-time diagram, like the one that's going to appear now, uh, <laughs> with time in the vertical axis and space in the horizontal axis, so that stationary objects are straight vertical lines because they don't move in space, they just go forward in time, then the speed of, of a op moving object is cos times two times the angle it makes with the vertical axis. But things are even weirder. It turns out that space and time are curved. How do you tell if something is curved? Well, you take an arrow, and without turning it, you move it around in a loop back to its initial position. If the arrow is still pointing in the same direction, then it was flat. If it's, cur if it's not, then it's curved, as you can see here on this uh, sphere. You move the arrow and come back to your original position, it's not pointing in the same direction. So how do you do that for space-time? Well, 
because my fingers are always moving forward in time, if I move them apart and then back again, they make a square in space-time, like in this picture. To see if space-time is curved, then I take two parallel arrows, I move them apart, and then back again. If they, uh, they come back parallel, then it's flat. If they come back and pointing in different directions, then it's curved. So this, <laughs> in this picture, you see Wolf, uh, which starts going off ahead, uh, uh, away from Müller. But because of the curvature in space-time, uh, her path gets deflected, and Wolf and Müller intersect again. So, in fact, curvature is nothing more than gravitational attraction. That means that if you concentrate a lot of matter, you can bend space and time more and more until maybe you can make time bend back into itself in the loop. That's a time machine. And such closed time loops where the past is the future can be found at the center of rotating black holes. Thank you.